Good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted it just worked out to have a little time. Um, we, I came down here from where we live. Down is not fair because you're here. <laughs> we, I came here from where we live in Palo Alto. If you all don't mind just shifting around a little, I don't quite have enough energy to stand up tonight, so just move your chairs if you're hidden. Um, I came here because for the last so many months, well, the last several years actually, Shivani has been putting forth this effort to make a movie that Swami Kriyananda wanted to have made. I had so much fun like, from the LAX, I'm fixed up on the taxi cab. Well, you know, I'm here to work on a movie. I think like, what do people <laughs> say? <laughs> I really, I just said it just so I could say it like that. <laughs> I don't think the taxi driver was at all impressed. But <laughs> That's what everybody does. That's what everybody does, and I felt like I was so in the bob. <laughs> but uh, a couple of years ago, Swami Kriyananda had the idea of making a movie about the Ananda community. And Shivani, who is, you all know because she's been here for months, she just put her willpower behind it and we filmed and the, the, what the, was called the director's cut where he puts together the first thing and we came down to see it and we saw it, whatever today is, today is Tuesday? We saw it yesterday. And we did it. We actually made a beautiful movie about Ananda. It's just absolutely thrilling. So I'm a little fizzed out, but I, <laughs> I'll just be fine. Now we're refining it. And apparently these things have to be kept really close under wraps until they're finished. So. That's all I can say. <laughs> Except it's very, very hard to communicate Ananda, and I really wasn't sure we were going to be able to do it. And the director's name is Ted Nicolau, and he just did a fabulous job of stitching the thing together. Santoshi's here, and Shivani and I, we've been working on it. <clears throat> I, I say that because that's what I'm going to be trying to talk about tonight, is the idea of community and what community is and how we do it. and. Um, it is really not easy to talk about. It's really not easy to describe. And when I really started thinking about it, I had a, a, a recollection in my mind. I went to Stanford University for one year. I actually flunked out, not because I couldn't do it, but because I lost interest. But I, I joke about it. I get as much mileage as possible out of the fact that I went to Stanford. I'm always telling people that I started college at Stanford in one way or another. <laughs> you know, when I'm trying to gain a little credibility, I'm really a college flunk out and never went back. But that first week at the college there, university, I was looking really for a spiritual path and a guru. So I went to college because I didn't know what else to do at that point. It was a few years later when I found Swamiji. Um, he found me. Let's really, let's put it like it is, right? Um, but that first week there, they had the idea, natural idea, that all the freshmen came a week early because we were all new, we were you know, away from home for the first time. It was 1967. And uh, we were 18 years old for the most part. And the idea was that we would all get to know each other and relax, but it was, it was the equivalent of gridlock. It's like every single one of us was so afraid um, that we might do something wrong or that we'd be rejected or we'd be misunderstood that it was like you had this however many hundreds of people and we were absolutely frozen. And I'm a keen observer of human nature even then. I just watched us all walk around, you know, and just be unable to risk anything. And I made a a yogic decision that I didn't know about the spiritual path yet except past lives, of course. I just decided that I would pretend that I wasn't vulnerable. And I would just pretend that I was perfectly confident and could just accept anyone and had nothing to fear. And I felt just like everyone else, but if, if I started pretending like that, which I did, it broke the gridlock. And I have one friend that is not part of Ananda now after 40 years of being part of Ananda. That was the friend I met practically the day that I made that decision. And we've been friends ever since. But it was like everything opened up that, that defined my whole year from that. Later on, um, Dharmaraj mentioned in 1969, I met Swami Kriyananda. By then I was 22, and I actually happened to meet him at Stanford, but it was pure chance, not anything else. Um, now, let me just a second, where was the thought in that? Uh, 
Oh, yes. Of course, you know, life went on, life went on after that. I, there was just one little piece of it that I wanted to put in. At a certain point, I, I became so bewildered by how much trouble people have finding friends, finding lovers, you know, finding a place in life, when absolutely everybody has the same anguishing need for each other. It just, it, and it still, to this day, it completely bewilders me. It, it's like, why, when, when we're all so tender, can't we just work it out? You know, and, and, and romantically, it's just, it's just always been a nightmare. You know, you have this entire group of one group over here that is desperately seeking partners, and you have this other group over here, and it just ought to work out. You know? <laughs> just, um, it's so confusing to me. <laughs> Don't you think so? Yeah. I've done years and years of couples counseling, and I, I just still, to, the, to this day, I'm just completely befuddled by it. There is a force, and the force has a name, and when I learned self-realization teachings, the force is called Maya. And Maya is the deceiver. And it has lots of different words, but Maya is just a great word. There's no equivalent in English. You have to throw in a little Sanskrit every now and then, because Maya is just the word. There's people who speak English <laughs> don't know they're being deceived, so they don't have a word for it. <laughs> <laughs> People on the other side of the world know it's they're being deceived. They have word for it. But there's just this chaos in our minds that basically tells us that white is black and black is white and happiness is sadness and sadness is happiness and this is a smart idea when it's really, really a stupid idea. But we roll on like this. And I used to be <clears throat> very disrespectful. I, and I used to be disrespectful of my own stupidity. I, that sounds silly, but I, I used to just tell myself that I ought to be different. My approach to life was to always be mad at myself, just ever so slightly. I went through this long cycle where I kept thinking that there was a far better version of me that for some reason I was just holding out on myself and if I continued to be really, really stern with the one who was inhabiting this body, that at a certain point she would say, ha ha, and she would go get the better one. <laughs> that sounds, you know, welcome, welcome to my brain. But that's what it was like. And one day I finally realized, with an appalling realization, that <laughs> this was it. There really was no better one. That, the, you know, that, that this was as good as it was going to get. And I'd really better make the best of what I had, because I was getting older and older. Um, but in all of that, there was still just that underlying question, which is the, what I was talking about, Maya, which is that, why isn't it that we can't find happiness? And why it's so hard to find happiness, and why it's so hard to do the things that will help us, and why we so consistently are afraid of the things that are actually going to help us. And that's where the word Maya comes in, and that's where that word is so subtle. Um, we can affirm all we want, we can kind of get together and hope for the best all we want, we can talk about how we all ought to behave, we can be stern with ourselves for years and years, but in the end there's another force at play. And fortunately <clears throat> the only enduring force is the light force. But this force of Maya also has to be reckoned with. And that's what I was starting to say. I didn't respect it. People will often say to me, have often said to me when I, you know, I'm counseling or trying to help people in some way or another, and they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, I know it's stupid. I know it's stupid that I should feel this way. I said, no, 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 it's not at all stupid that you should feel that way. If it were stupid, you wouldn't feel that way. You know, the, the, um, <clears throat> the forces that confuse us are very, very powerful. That's why a lot of spiritual traditions who don't have the benefit of the word Maya use the word Satan. And Satan is really not a very popular word anymore. People are really not keen on the concept of Satan. But Satan is a, is a, a very useful idea, and a very true one, actually, because it gives us the reality of the fact that there is a powerful enemy that we're not just sort of wandering around here without an opponent. 
and that if we just keep kind of drifting along, we'll actually stumble into everything good. Because there's another force. And, you know, there's a big, long philosophical question, which fascinatingly, Master and Swamiji answer beautifully. It's not like there is no answer, but let's not go there yet. When we get to the Q&A, we can go there if you want to, but not yet. But it's a real thing. And we can't just dismiss it. We can't just say, oh, it's stupid to feel this way. We have to, that's why I was starting to say, I used to not respect my own ignorance. And now I think of it like this. I spent so long getting this confused. <laughs> you know? I believe in reincarnation. How many incarnations have I spent just, tr- you know, mixing up myself and practicing the wrong ideas and uh, just doing the wrong thing and thinking it was the right thing? And, and so by now, it's a, very, it's a very tightly woven web. And just the mere idea that we ought to change is not enough to change us. Even the deep, profound intellectual commitment that we ought to change is not enough to change us. Because there's an, another opponent in the ring. And whether we can see him punching us or not, you know, he's, he's binding our ankles, however you want to call it. Or you use Maya, which is more neutral in the West, where there's just this web over us. <clears throat> now, what all of this has to do with spiritual community is everything. Because the, the whole drama of this planet involves each other. And the whole drama of this age involves each other. There are spiritual ages in which solitude is really the ticket. Um, You have, right after Jesus died in the first few centuries, you have all the desert fathers. They just went out by themselves. It was a very dark age on the planet, and there was just no way. You just really couldn't have anything to do with anything. If you wanted God, you just went away. You read the life of St. Anthony of the desert, and he, he spent 40 years in this cave, and then the neighborhood got crowded because three other hermits moved in, you know, so... (laughs) He walked another 40 days into the desert and found another cave. And I mean, it's, it's, when you actually parse apart, it's, 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 an, uh, it's an appalling life from a certain point of view. But just decades, literally, like 80 years, he spent all by himself meditating. And that's just, like, that's not our life. Look at us. I mean, look how close we live together. Look how many of us are together. And, and even when Yogananda incarnated in this age, he gave us what is really a crazy paradox because he announced, after going through a number of iterations, that the name of his work, I won't say the name of his organization because it's not the name of his organization, it's the name of his work, it's self-realization, well, that's a good one, we get that one, fellowship. How on earth do you put that together? Because self-realization is about me and God, but fellowship obviously involves somebody else, you know? Like, who is that somebody else? And Yogananda was very explicit about it because the whole idea of intentional communities that Kriyananda started is because Master told him to do so, or, or said that it should be done, told him to do so. And because Master says, and Swami writes, in this age, um, we need each other. First of all, it's, it's too hard it's too hard to hold these ideas by yourself. It's just impossible. Um, in the New Path, Swami's book, in the, there's a, at, the, at the end of the last part of the book, Less is More, I believe is what the chapter is still called, the incredible essay about the importance of community. And as he puts it, no person of high ideals needs to have explained to them how difficult it is to hold to those ideals. In this age, um, you live in Los Angeles. <laughs> Palo Alto is not a lot better. Palo Alto has a different vibe. The vibe of Palo Alto is that I'll describe Palo Alto and then I'll let you characterize Los Angeles. Palo Alto is this. Palo Alto is highly educated, very cultural, um, cosmopolitan, highly intelligent, uh, very, people of very refined taste, people who know how to make money, people who know how to spend money, you know, creatively making a last-ditch effort to find satisfaction from the material plane. Just like, we're going to do this as well as it can be done, and it's going to work for us this time. 
Yeah. You know, I, I, when people come to visit us, I say, anything you want is 10 minutes from this house, you know, where our community is. I mean, it's a fabulous area. I love living there. One of the reasons we've been so successful is that people are cultured, cosmopolitan, intelligent, creative. They know how to make and spend money. I mean, all of those things, they do it all really well. It's great. It suits me perfectly. But I'm just totally amused, you know, just by all that energy directed into one of Maya's most <laughs> transparent tricks, you know? I mean, I go for walks in this particular neighborhood because, gosh, every house is gorgeous. And not just lavish, but tasteful and creative. And, and it's like, I wonder how many people in those houses are happy. You know, I wonder how many are happy. And at Christmas time in our neighborhood where we live, we, I mean, I know, I thought, I laughed when we were out Christmas caroling. Oh, I bet they don't do a lot of Christmas caroling from the ashram in L.A., do they? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how many of the Orthodox Jews in this neighborhood would welcome <laughs> that? But, but in our neighborhood, we can. But we just go door to door, and I've always been the runner. I knock on the door, we're going to come and sing you a Christmas carol. People look at me. I mean, they've gotten used to us. We've been there 20 years. But they look at me like, what planet are you from? <laughs> You're gonna, I'm going to sing you a Christmas carol. And amazingly, people will say, no, I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, sometimes I just won't put up with it. It depends on the year. Doing what? <laughs> I said, how long is one Christmas carol? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, and then I'll just watch these people just close the door. You know? And it's not like I'm looking at shiny eyes. I'm looking at people who have just like, and I say this, I mean, this is the truth. They've been hurt so much, they're just going to close down and just open just as much as they need to because the possibility of pain coming in is so much greater in their mind than joy coming in. It's just not worth the risk anymore. Okay? How long do we live that way? It's really up to us. And does it take courage to reverse that trend? Absolutely, don't underestimate it. But why not? You know, why not? It's, Ananda is, is the most peculiar thing on the planet. I absolutely know that watching frame by frame of this movie today, which is like an hour and 45 minutes, whatever it is. I mean, I was saying to the two other women in the room, we've been in this together for a long time. My God, we did it. I don't really know how we did it. I think Master did it. No, what, what a stupid thing to say. I know who did it. <laughs> but it was done because there's this very fine line that is Ananda, which is, it's absolutely everything um, that your heart really wants. But you get there by a very different route than the way you think you're going to get there. A few years ago, uh, I, the context is not even really important, but periodically in community, well, especially in our communities, because our communities are about personal growth, so our communities are not about settling in, which is what this story is about. There was this whole big brouhaha about something, the details of which completely escaped me. And there was this big, like, sound, sound and fury signifying nothing, isn't that the phrase? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about how people at Ananda ought to feel safe. They ought to feel safe. And, you know, these are like these phrases that just come out of somewhere, and everybody repeats them to each other. People at Ananda ought to feel safe. And I'd listen to it, and I, I said, no, they should feel totally threatened. That is the whole point. You know, we're not here to feel safe. What does it mean to feel safe? It means that I get to bring my consciousness at exactly the size it's in right now into this space, and no one's going to challenge it. I, excuse me. First of all, what happens to such people? They're the people who don't have time for the Christmas carol. Because there's an opponent in the ring with you. And if you're not actively working to stand up to incarnations of wrong thinking, 
you're not just going to be able to just get on the raft and float into a higher state of consciousness. But the marvelous thing about the path of self-realization, as the, as the way Swamiji put it, it's not an all-or-nothing situation. It's not like nothing, 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 top of Mount Everest. <laughs> you know? It's like every step that you take in the right direction is a step into the light and out of the darkness. And every little battle that you fight and win, you have fought and won a battle. And the, the, the power of Ananda community is not flashy. It's not where everybody comes together for one weekend and we have this huge cathartic experience. And, you know, I've done those things and I'm sure many of you have done those things and you have tremendous insights and you do have an experience. I'm not belittling it. But somehow that experience just after a little while, you can't find it anymore. You go back and you meet those same people and uh, it's not quite there anymore. Ananda's just, it's much more, it's like an ice cube melting is how somebody put it to me once. <laughs> it's like you're not really quite sure that anything's happened. <laughs> Except where there used to be a lump, there's kind of an expanding puddle. And, and then pretty soon you are somebody you never imagined and you don't even recognize yourself and you don't know how you got there. I had an experience when I, when I first came to Ananda village, I was 24. Um, I was different, let's just put it like that. I, you know, I mean, I had factors, like my hair was longer and I wore glasses and things like that. And the name Asha is the name Swami Kriyananda gave me, maybe when I was 25 or 26. It's not the name my mother gave me or ever called me, but that's the name that I had. Um, and I, I, right at the very beginning, they put me into the kitchen. Not because I could cook, because I was a food fanatic, so I actually specifically could not cook. But I was interested in food and I had lots of energy and nobody else would do the job, you know. <laughs> How do you know it's your dharma to do something, Swami once said? Well, if you're next in line and the job needs to be done. <laughs> so that's how I ended up in the kitchen. Um, but uh, So part of what I did in there, because I had to cook so much, is that everybody who came to the retreat to help would come in and chop vegetables and wash dishes and so on. So I met everybody. The retreat then was, if you've ever been to Ananda Village, is what's now the seclusion retreat. It was the, the distant, small, very close in. So anyway, so I was there. And among people who came to visit was this couple from New York. And they were there for several weeks. And we spent a lot of time together in the kitchen. Mm, five, six, seven years later, Swami Kriyananda took a trip to New York and I went with him to New York. We stayed with that couple. My name had changed, my hair was shorter, maybe I had contact lenses, maybe I had different glasses, I don't remember. And I said, oh, it's so nice to meet you. Yeah, I remember you from the, from the uh, when you came to the retreat, I was working in the kitchen. No, no, we've never met you before. That's what they said. I said, well, I worked with you in the kitchen. No, that wasn't you. That's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> I denied it one more time and then I said you're right it wasn't the same person <laughs> when God asks, hands you a gift don't throw it back in his face absolutely not I've totally changed that girl's gone forever where did she go she went away one minute at a time and the, the power of community is yeah, you know, you all have a lot of, well, actually, you have so many fun things to do. It's just so exciting to be about to lose your lease and have no place to go. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just like when this project started, I said to my husband, oh, man, I would just love to be there. You know, just right from the ground where nothing is in place and there's no money, there's no people. It's just like... <laughs> Just like, what fun! Because all you have is God and each other. And so you just get to practice and play and have adventures and reminisce later about the good old days, you know, <laughs> in a way that life really rarely gives you. You know, so much of life is just so dull. And at the end, you don't have anything much to say. Whoa, remember the summer when we went to Belgium and they lost our suitcases? Whoa, that was awesome.
<laughs> and the waters close over you and boom, it's just gone. <laughs> but to do something impossible for God, and believe me, we just made a movie about Ananda, so talk about impossible. You know, there is no limit with you and God. But it's all based, 100% based, on personal commitment to personal growth. And when that actually starts, not to mistake it for somebody hurting you or doing something to you. That's what's so confusing. We pray and pray and pray and then God answers our prayers and we don't know it. <laughs> you know, somebody came to me once and he was just so upset about something that somebody had done to him. And I said, yeah, it's even, it's even more, the test is even more exquisite when you're right. That's a very special kind of test. When they actually are mistreating you and they actually have misunderstood you and they really are stupid and misguided. And by any objective standard, they are. And it's still your problem because it upset you and it caused your heart to close and it caused you to panic a little bit about life you know we life is this is maya you know you just need a, a big you know like people put things on their mirror just put the word maya on your mirror <laughs> because anything that tells you that you are not loved by god and that God is not loving you with everything that's happening is, is Maya. I recently have had a, a really magnificent experience. A year and a half ago, um, I was gonna, I, I'm sitting here like I can't remember, Swami Kriyananda, I'm embarrassed to have to pause and say like that. <laughs> <laughs> Swami Kriyananda decided he would write a book, and he was going to write a book called Miracles and Answered Prayers. And some of you may know because he sent out a, a, you know, please send me stories and so on. And he worked on it for a short time. And then when he showed up at our house, we're the closest house to the international airport to Ananda Village. So Swamiji tends to, to leave and return from the country through our living room. So he was leaving on, in June of 2011. And he showed up in the house with a stack of paper, and he says, I don't really want to write this book, you write this book. <laughs> and he hands me this printed out heap of the stories that he's collected. Um, here, you write this book of miracles and answered prayers. And I'd written one book, which is this book, and he'd been, you know, he, he said to me on several times, well, are you almost finished with the second volume? And I've had to say, haven't started. So I think he just got tired of me procrastinating, so he said, here, write this book. I mean, I know that's what he did. I never would have chosen to write a book on that subject. I'm, I'm a pretty pragmatic person, and I, you, you rarely hear me say the word miracle, or I just don't, I don't go there that much. It's not my way. People have, everybody has their own bob, and I'm just, a, I, I matriculated at Stanford University. <laughs> me this thing to write this book on miracles and answers prayers. I say to my husband David, only to my husband David, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? It was just like nothing I wanted to do, but and Swamiji directly tells you to do something. You don't have any choice. And I knew what he was doing because he wanted me to write and he knew I wasn't doing it. So, okay. So I'm going to write this book. And then I had to get more stories and just, you know, who I, I put the word out and I went to a couple of the Ananda communities and I went to Ananda village. I sat there for 12 days, like 12 hours a day for like 12 days. And people just came in and talked to me. I typed pretty fast. So you know, I just would type and they would talk. I'd look them in the eye and they would tell me. And they would tell me from their point of view, the miracles and answered prayers that had happened in their life. Well, there was one miracle in that whole thing, which was me. You know, I'm sitting just looking at all these different people and, you know, some people are gloriously successful and some people have come through hard and they're, they're tired and they're beaten down and they've been through tough stuff. Every single person just had these eyes and just looked right at me and, you know, I'm typing just staring right at them. And God has entered their life in a way that is unmistakably true. 
whether it was, you know, to give them a car they could afford, you, to, to give them a butterfly when they were out on a walk, you know, or a, an extra lemon in the refrigerator, or literally to be about to have a head-on collision and find themselves a hundred feet away with no footprints in between. You know, I mean, it, it goes like that. But it really didn't matter because what had happened to every single person was that the fear had cracked and the, the, the truth of our life had come out. And uh, I just came out different. And the book, I, the title, is called Loved and Protected. Loved and Protected. That's the name of the book. And that's just it. But that's a minute-by-minute minute life experience. And if we are fortunate enough to realize that there's a power greater than us, to find you know, whatever level of involvement, all of you in this room, some of whom I know and some of I've never met, with a power like this that's represented behind me, and other people who have actually captured that. You know, this is not a resource to be squandered. This is not something to just say, oh yeah, that's nice. Yeah, maybe, you know, after I get this together, maybe later, maybe when they're in a more convenient neighborhood, maybe when I can have a room I like better, you know, maybe after I get my IRA built up a little more, I, you know, all those reasons. It's like when you really weigh it in the big scale and you ask yourself just a really, really simple question, where does my happiness really come from? And what am I afraid of? A couple came to me the other day and they said, we're thinking about moving in the community and they just got that far. I said, well, why not? Ours is an apartment community. Why not? And they said, well, we were thinking about moving in. I said, why not? They said, well, we were thinking about... I said, why not? <laughs> you know, I said, do you have children? No, we've never had children. Do you have pets? No. They said, we have a hamster. I said, okay, the hamster can come. Okay. Do you have money? Yes. Do you work? No. We have money. We don't work. We don't have children. I said, why not? You know, like, why not? Oh, because we have a view of the water from our house, you know. Like, okay, when death comes, yes, I could have really devoted my life to searching God, but I had a view of the water out of me. <laughs> <laughs> we want to sing you a Christmas carol. I'm sorry, I'm busy. No, but it's very easy. Yeah, it's very, very easy. And, and uh, just, there, this is something really unusual, the opportunity to really search for God. And, oh, is it convenient? No, of course not. <laughs> and will we have trials and troubles? Absolutely. You know, a few years ago, we were in this huge lawsuit thing that went on and on, and John Parsons has written a book. It's a great book. And you know, there was a period of time, brief, but you know, there was the actual real possibility we'd lose everything. The community we live in, we don't own. We lease it, and therefore, there was no possibility of a court judgment against it. We couldn't be evicted because it wasn't owned by anything that was being sued. But nonetheless, the picture was in our mind that we might be evicted, and so we kind of played out the image. And I think because I am from a Jewish family and born in 1947, so you have the whole Eastern European thing. You know, my, all my people, my elder, the other people all came through Ellis Island. They were all the Eastern European refugees and so on. And so I always think, disaster to me always looks like about the 1935. <laughs> you know, the women have high-heeled shoes on and kind of wool skirts and the men are wearing jackets and hats and all the suitcases are made out of leather with leather straps. <laughs> Everybody's carrying them, nobody's wheeling them. So the picture in my mind, like the subconscious picture of losing our community, was all of us just standing in the, on the little street right in front where you moved to turn in. And we're all dressed in the, like 1935. <laughs> and all our stuff is in little leather suitcases and we're carrying it. But the picture to me was always filled with laughter. There we were, we'd lost everything. 
and we didn't have any place to live and no place to go. And there's 20 of us, or 40 of us, or 150 of us, and we're standing on the sidewalk holding our little bags, and we say, okay, what's next? And then we just kind of march down the road to God knows where. <laughs> but God knows where. You know? But to get to that, it's, it's a minute-by-minute minute willingness to always ask yourself the question, what is Dharma here? Dharma, the word Dharma means, I know everybody hears it these days, it means that action, attitude, thought, feeling, which will take me into higher consciousness. What is Dharma here? So, I think the tests are more exquisite when everybody who's attacking you is wrong. <laughs> because you then so want to have the satisfaction of just telling them that they're wrong. But then you have to ask yourself, is that really Dharma? Will that really take me to higher consciousness? That's all that community is. Everything else spills out afterwards. Once the individuals are united in the fellowship of self-realization and have the nerve to trust each other. Not to be right, because with all due respect, if, uh, they, if everybody was going to be always right, it, if you were on a planet where everybody was always, always right, you wouldn't be on this one. <laughs> so the chances are really good that the people around you, and again, I hate to say this, are a lot like you, which means that they're going to make some horrendous bloopers, often at your expense. You know, just horrendous bloopers at your expense. But if everybody is in a fellowship of self-realization, not you promised me I'd be safe. Then you just get together and you figure it out. Maybe you just go back into your cave for a while until you get yourself organized and you ask yourself, what's Dharma here? And what's Dharma is to do that which leads to higher consciousness, which means you open your heart, encourage to God in everything. And it just cannot be overestimated what an absolute revolution that is. One, how it gives you security that even you won't even find in Palo Alto. You just won't find it. And ultimately, how it gives you joy beyond your wildest imaginings. I, I, the, I, the first time I realized how strange this was was when I was really early on the spiritual path. And there was a particular person there, Swami Kriyananda puts it so sweetly. He says, this is a very old spiritual family. We've had many incarnations together, which means, as he put it, we have been all things to each other. So it's not only that your best friends are there, but your worst enemies are also there. Because, you know, you were drawn to each other, and you played out all these different things. So I had one of those worst enemy people who was right there in the community with me, and whose life pattern matched mine, so we were always together. <laughs> and we loathed one another with just an intensity that I can't conjure anymore because it was too, too early in my spiritual life. I was in my 20s. Everything was tray tray dramatic, right? <laughs> and we just, you know, it was something else. And it was valid. I went, I had a dream of a past life, of all the horrible things that this person did to me, so they went to a psychic and learned all the horrible things I did to them, and <laughs> Swami just said, I think it's all true, you know? Because <laughs> it was. But you know then what he said? But none of, neither of you would ever do anything like that again. But, you know, there was a lot to forgive. There was a lot to forgive, and there was a lot in the past to forgive, and a lot in the present to forgive. It was just an endless cycle of, let's see what I can do to make your life miserable now. This is so ironic, because I think of those years as idyllic. Parallel to the absolutely perfect thing was this constant, you know, intense negative drama that just went on and on. I'll give you a last part. This was a woman. But when we finally solved all of this, which was just fabulous, and got to the point where it was just a joke, at the very end, of, it, of the karma, you know, which was like about 15 years of karma. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were talking about it, and, and at that point she came to me and said, she apologized, because she realized, she, it took, I, I got it a little faster. 
whatever. But anyway, she realized and she apologized and she apologized for just how stupid we had both been. And we were standing in a reception in a public place and it had been some kind of an event. We were both dressed in white. We were drinking tea. I had a cup of Earl Grey tea with milk, which was my favorite tea. We're sitting there talking together. I had nothing but goodwill at this point. She speaks to me about how sorry she is about some of the, you know, bad things we did to one another. And I said, oh, there's no problem at all. All is forgiven. Then, almost against my will, I picked up my teacup and I poured the entire cup of tea just right down the front of her white dress. Just like that. I didn't decide to do it. It was just happened like that. It was perfectly still and I just poured this hot tea down the front, stained her dress. We looked at each other and we burst out laughing. It was just like, oh, I guess there was a little left after all. <laughs> it was unbelievable. The, my favorite picture of that woman is when she saw her dress and looked at me and then just she just threw back her head and roared with laughter. It just couldn't have been funnier for either of us. Okay. Now, going back just a little bit, in the middle of the worst, I realized she was my best friend. And I'm not just saying, oh, because she was teaching me things. I realized she was actually my best friend. That because we were both 100% devoted to God, we were in the fellowship of self-realization, and we were utterly tied to each other for all eternity. And the fact that we loathed one another was so incidental to the real bond. Now, you know, it just sounds like, it, it sounds really strange until you start living it. And then you just realize, I'm not this personality. But you can't learn that living in an apartment. You can't learn that just going to work and coming home and going to the movies and going to have coffee. You have to be in a fellowship of self-realization because you have to be with people you can trust. And you can't trust them to be nice all the time, but you can trust them to be with you in the fellowship of self-realization. And you make that community, I'll, I'll give you one more point, and then I'll, oh, it's a time for Q&A, but let me give you one small thing. <coughs> this was told to me, actually, Daya Taylor told me this. Daya now lives in, um, wherever she lives now. In Delhi. Delhi, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Is she on live? Hi, Daya. I checked this story with you, so you've confirmed this. <laughs> Daya is, hi, dear. She's this beautiful, outgoing woman. She has a very just wonderful personality. And she came to Ananda through our church. And she'd just been accustomed. She was a successful businesswoman. She'd just been accustomed to relating to people. And she came to our church, and she just tried to work the room in a very good way, but just like she would. Because she was a fearless, strong woman. She said she was like Teflon, is how she put it. She just, like, she just couldn't get anybody to see her. <laughs> just, you know, like nothing would happen. She was very attractive, everything. She just was totally bewildered. And she finally sort of gave up and stopped relating to us and started relating to them. She just started relating to the masters. And as soon as she started relating to the masters, everybody started relating to her. Because it's a fellowship of self-realization. It's not a tribe. It's not a, let's all be nice to you and you'll be nice to me. It's not, we're not networking. I love our church because there's absolutely no social benefit to being in our church. <laughs> there's no status. There's no networking. There's just nothing. It's like the only reason to come in there is because you love God and you want to be in that atmosphere. But and once you want to be in that atmosphere, a quality of relationship with people where the best friends, it really doesn't even matter if you like each other. It just, everybody loves everybody because we're all in it together. And, you know, like, talk about committed. It, yeah, like, you, you can't even, you, you can maybe sneak away for one lifetime, but you're stuck. <laughs> and it's, you work it out now, or you work it out now. I mean, like, it's always now. So, once, and once that starts, just this power comes into your life. A power of uh, courage and commitment and fellowship and help. It's just heaven on earth, even when it isn't. Okay, that's my little story. Questions? Do you have questions of any kind before? Because I can <coughs> self-evidently talk for a long time. <laughs> Do we have any 
or something you might like me to address? Ashtar, there's a story that I read about Krishna where he had an, um, an enemy who was constantly trying to destroy him. And like in the end, Krishna actually ended up killing him, actually destroyed him. But the man, right before he died, realized that Krishna was his guru and became liberated as a result of that. So it just kind of seems like it ties in. There's such, yeah. such sweet stories. They're such sweet stories. And you can't get away from it. Yeah, you can't get away from God. God is always helping you no matter what you think is happening. It was like this, his hatred that he had of Krishna yeah. was this strong tie. And as yeah. soon as he turned that hatred to love, everything went up. I love those stories. Fabulous. What's the Mara story again? Rama Mara? Oh, well, that was, uh, Valmiki tells that story about himself. He describes himself, I think it's Valmiki, am I correct? He describes himself as the worst brigand and the worst criminal. And, um, and then when he decided to reform, he was so evil that he couldn't even, they, they gave him the mantra Rama, but he couldn't even say it because he was so evil. So his guru said to him, we'll say Mara, which is another word for Maya or the devil. So he said, Mara, 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 and it just turned into Rama, 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 Rama. So they tricked him by getting him to say, Mara, Rama, Mara. <laughs> they put his energy where it was going, and then it gradually went the other direction. Of course, Valmiki tells that story on himself, so who knows if it's really true. But it, there's profound truth in it. Yeah, we just keep struggling. The one thing I've seen about the spiritual path it's odd, but all you have to do is not quit. At the beginning, you think you have to triumph in some incredible way, but actually all you have to do is not quit. I, I remember, I, I have to be careful because I will cry when I talk about this. I remember I looked at Nitai one day and I noticed that he'd gotten older, which was a clue that it might have happened to me. <laughs> you no, know, but I, when I knew him, he was the same, when I first knew him, he was the same age as me. He was 24, 25, you know, all of us then had so much hair and big beard and I looked at him and his hair was white and and I said we came young and we're old and we're still here you know it was just like that was so small but it was so big because I knew how many tests he'd been through and he knew how many tests I'd been through and we're still here we didn't say we didn't have time for the Christmas carols anymore we just kept the door open that's all you have to do but that takes everything Um, actually, it's going to come out. I'm going to India on Sunday. Um, Swamiji asked me to uh, think more globally about what I'm doing. I've been in the colony leader there for... I'm not, he's not taking me out of there. But uh, um, he asked me to just travel more. And Anyway, so they're going to bring it out in India almost right away. It's, already, it's almost ready to be uh, printed. And then uh, I think they'll bring it out in the spring. It's a very nice book. I, I, I hope it'll be beneficial to others. I feel like the whole purpose of the book has already been fulfilled because of what it did for me. But if it can do a fraction of that for anyone else, I'll be very grateful. It's a very nice book. It's a very nice book. So we'll see. The title. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> I know, I love the title. It's very happy. Certainly, Laurie. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you turn a longing for human love into a longing for divine love? Do you recognize that? That's a distraction for you. Well, nobody believes that human love is really a distraction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we try to say that it is, but very few people really, really in their own hearts believe it. In fact, Swamiji said something very interesting. He actually said it, it doesn't make any, I have a visual memory, so I remember what he said because I can see where he was sitting and it was when he was living here in Los Angeles that he said it. But it was fascinating. He said, I'm inclined to believe that the idea that you actually have a soulmate is true because the longing to be loved is so deep in the human heart. And he said, not just loved impersonally, but loved personally. 
He said, it's so deep in the human heart that it, I can't imagine that God would put that in your heart without also promising the fulfillment of it. Wasn't that an amazing statement? I really just thought about it. Swami is so practical. You know, there's just no pretense about his spiritual, his spiritual life, the way he puts it. Now, bear in mind, a soulmate is not a romantic partner. And Master talked about soulmates only once. And I finally really got the context. It's, I mean, is this correct? Dharma Raju, you have a mind for these details, you might know. I'm pretty sure it's in the Bible commentaries. And it was in the, what man, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. I've always wondered why he would have talked about soulmates in the commentary on the Bible. I, I have remembered this accurately. Because the fundamental religionists have said that means that divorce is a sin against God. But then Master was trying to, to dismantle that extremely narrow-minded idea. Swamiji said, listen, I've seen a lot of couples who've stayed together their whole lives, and I wouldn't always call it a spiritual victory. <laughs> is how he put it? <laughs> he said, merely to gut it out is not necessarily to be victorious. But what Master said that really meant is that there is such a thing as soulmates, and that nothing will ever separate you from that, and that, as he put it, before you at attain enlightenment, there has to be those, the, those two halves come together. And, and Swamiji said, Master never talked about it, because then everybody would be standing on the street corner looking for their soulmate. And they would totally forget about the spiritual path and their soulmate. I mean, just to begin with, it would be sexual. Okay? Like, enlightenment means that you've transcended identity with your physical body. What to speak of being compelled by the imperatives of your physical body. Okay, sex is a physical imperative. You know, like being hungry or being cold. It's an imperative that your body demands of you. Tremendous force behind it. But when you realize God, or even when you advance spiritually, you're um, capable of, of surmounting physical imperatives. That's where all the austerities of the spiritual path come from, and celibacy and so on, at a certain stage it's very appropriate because you have uh, come to a karmic point where you have the capacity, as Swamiji put it, he said the difficulty with celibacy is that it should make you lighter and lighter, but too often, as he put it, it makes you tighter and tighter. <laughs> <laughs> because it just, it's too much for you. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I have, I have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I'm really not good at being cold, either. It's like, there's a lot of imperatives that push me, okay? And that longing for a partner is, a, is just a deeply held, divinely given reality. So I've never found it very useful to try to talk yourself out of it. The, because I don't think it's sincere. I mean, because even people who you know, make a big deal about getting around it, they just haven't met the right person yet. And that person sails in, and you know, it's very difficult. I mean, it's not always an intelligent choice, but nonetheless. But uh, I find it much easier to just be completely sincere and just tell God that, you know, here we are, and do something, you know? <laughs> just like, either solve it, or release me, or give me the capacity to endure. But just don't, let's just be, let's call a spade a spade and just stay there. Because, good, goodness, it's, you know, t to leave your spiritual path, to be with someone who is not of the fellowship of self-realization, who is not really a spiritual partner to you, is really a mistake. It's, it's just unfortunate. But to want to live in partnership, because you want to live in partnership, it's just, there's a whole lot worse things in the world. So I would spend your energy on the worst things. And if it's not given to you, then you endure. And you, you try to develop endurance rather than trying to talk yourself out of something there's not much hope of talking yourself out of. I have two questions, yeah. yeah. Situation that, does a soulmate necessarily have to be a romantic partner? No, in fact... I mean, it could be a could it be like a strong friendship with some other person or something? 
See, the whole question of soulmates, that's why Master never talked about it. Um, by, by its very definition, if there's a sexual component, you, even if it is your soulmate for all time, you haven't realized what you're really going for. Because it can't be. Because sex, which is touted in our age as being the apex, is really extremely gross. You know, and if we weren't so compelled to do it, we'd notice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an old woman. I love it. <laughs> Sorry, David. <Jamie. laughs> Did you have something to say? <laughs> there was a question online if you knew Bob Raymer. I met Bob Raymer, but I don't know him. He came to Ananda in 1993. He's a disciple of Oliver Black. And he's a, no, excuse me. He's a direct disciple of Master. And he was with, in Michigan with Oliver Black. And he was a, he, there's, vi there's YouTube videos of him. You can see him now. He's passed away. But he was a very natural devotee. He was a good example, because he was just himself. You know, the, my, my um, objection to SRF, one of my objections to SRF, <laughs> is that they've made Master a little two-dimensional. I don't mean, and I, I don't mean two-dimensional, but two-dimensional. You know what I mean? There's just too flat. All the, all the curves and valleys have been taken out and he's just too distant. And therefore, the, the, to be a disciple is, is too stiff. But Master's disciples were characters. You know they would be, because the closer you get to your origin point, the more original you become, and the more spontaneous and natural. So, yeah. Uh, yes? Could you elaborate on the reincarnation, like the origins, and the way you understand it, and the omnipresence, and infinity? The way I understand reincarnation is really pretty simple. There is a goal to the process of being in a physical body and that goal is to transcend all identification with anything other than the infinite. That's your physical body, your ego, your identity, pain, physical compulsions, all these things. It you can make progress in one incar the span of one incarnation, but self-evidently, no one, or virtually no one, reaches the goal. So either the whole thing is a horrible, pointless joke, or else we've just got to have more time. So just in the same way that from one day to the next, things evolve, from one decade to the next, things evolve, from one body to the next, things evolve. And you die, with whatever level of awareness you have. And it's, it's, no, there's nobody judging you, it's just what you have come to understand to be real, how you have come to understand yourself, what you have come to understand is the source of your happiness. And all of that defines your level of consciousness. And you die at that vibration, you hang out in an appropriate astral world for a while, until your unresolved desires and lessons cause you to suddenly wake up in another body. I think of it like this. I'm sure you've had this experience. Oh, you come home from work. You think, I'm, you know, I'm just going to clean up a little bit. I'm going to have a long, med I'm going to do some yoga postures. I'm going to have a long meditation. I'll chant a little bit. I'll read a spiritual book. I'll go to bed early. But I'm a little hungry. So maybe I'll have a snack. Hmm. Not much in the refrigerator. But I could just go down to that pizza place just half a block away. So you go down to the pizza place, and then you're there, and then a friend comes in. Hey, we're going to go down and see that really new movie at The Grove. That's the place you'll go to, right? Whoa, I've been really wanting to see that. Here, I'll just eat my pizza fast and we'll go. At midnight, you come home, and you see your meditation beats there. And you don't quite remember when you decided not to do that. But somehow or another, all the other restless things just drew you. So we die, we go to the astral world, it's a great relief for a while, and then somehow we get hungry. We get hungry for a cigarette, which they don't have in the astral world. We get hungry for sex, which they don't have in the astral world. We get hungry for my soulmate, and we see that cute boy who married my best friend is incarnated over there, and bingo, suddenly. 
<laughs> and darned if we're not his sister. How did that happen, you know? <laughs> and we can't quite remember when we made the decision because it's just the whole flow of energy. That's how I think it works. That's the gospel according to Asha, but that's how I think it works. <laughs> so, I, like you said, here we are, you know, close to uh, when we have to move out of here. The yeah. Oh yeah, we're going to get practical again. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, uh-huh. and, you know, you know what we're trying to do. We, we want to create community. Sure. We want to have more and more of a sense of community with one another, not just the people at the ashram, but the people who come. And so, uh, could you tell us, in your experience with building community, what <coughs> kind of... Uh, attitudes, what kind of um, ideas, what kind yeah. of prayers even, every one of us are just here, but everyone, everyone should do it. just hold close to our hearts just to yeah. be able to materialize this. We were in, uh, we didn't start from scratch in Palo Alto, there was a, an ashram house and uh, we actually had, the whole of Ananda Palo Alto started with East West Bookshop, which Swami's told that story, it existed, Swami bought it and then people came from Ananda Village to run it. And then they started having Sunday services upstairs in the bookshop. Then they moved into a house. But the time we got there, we were renting one room storefront, which was about the size of this living room. They, Anandi and Bharat had been in charge for a while. And we had one room, the bookstore was there, and then they had a house about like this, um, about this size. Actually, it was bigger. There were more people in it. Well, I don't know if it was bigger, but there were more people in it. <laughs> um, and we were living in a classy neighborhood. We always live in the best neighborhoods. Um, and we had to fold all that up. I think we chose to fold it all up. We folded up the house. And we wanted to get a community. Um, Santoshi was there. She came there at that time. And we were going to... Um, Santoshi actually was instrumental in arranging for the apartments to be purchased and so on. But before any of that actually happened, we were with Swamiji and we asked him exactly that question. How should we pray for this? Because there was that certain hesitation that all of us as devotees have, that we were, we're a little bit hesitant to demand something specific of God. And Swami is not like that, but we are a little timid. And he looked at us and the first thing he said, well, he said, don't even ask if it's a good idea. It's self-evidently a good idea. He was trying to get us off of this timidity. Oh, well, maybe he wants this, maybe he wants that, maybe he wants that. Essentially, of course he wants this. He said, and just pray to God that you be an instrument for making it happen. He said, this is, you're doing this to help others, you're doing it to serve Master. Just be completely committed to the rightness of it. And that was, it was very interesting for me in the material success course. There's a whole section in there. It's not vivid to my mind, but it was very vivid when I was giving the class about how you just have to see it and you can't allow in your mind all these mitigating conditions to come. You just have to keep looking at it. And the most ridiculous example where you learn sometimes these big lessons in little ways, the blue clothes that the Naya Swamis are wearing. Um, when Swamiji decided to make the Naya Swami order, he, at that time he wanted us to have a, a habit where we all wore exactly the same thing. And I happened to be there, he asked me to work on it. So later on, I started having to manifest this thing. And I spent a year, well, did I spend a year? I spent a lot of time and a lot of money just trying to manifest this, this habit, which you would think would be simple to do. But it was very interesting to me. I could always see it in my mind. And I just kept working and working and working and working. It was a tiny project compared to what you're dealing with. But I could always see it, and I never doubted it. And ask Shivani about the Ananda movie. Yeah, yeah that's ex- I mean, and that's a much bigger example. It was an impossible project. Swamiji asked her to do it. She never doubted that it would be done. And even when for months at a time it didn't look like it would happen, it didn't matter to her. It was going to happen. Swami wanted it to happen. It was self-evidently a good idea. It would happen. And if it was inconvenient, if there was tapasya, if it didn't work out, you just you need to see what you're looking for. Whether you're looking for a house, whether you're looking for an apartment, a temple, a, an outdoor place, who knows. But what you're seeing, and when, we've, when we started manifesting our community, we had a big meeting. And everybody thinks you should think about, 
you know, we want a garden, we want a driveway, we want a bedroom like this, we want a window. No, 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 no. We want a place where we can be together to love God. We want a place where other people will feel welcome. We talked about what we wanted to feel like in that place. Because what we wanted to feel like and what we wanted to have happen through that place, that was the reality of the place. And the, the physical place, you see, it all comes afterwards. First you have to have the causal plane, which is the, the, the idea of it. You have to have the energy of it. Then it comes about. And so where you really need to be clear is what it needs to feel like. And everything that I was talking about is what it needs to feel like. We're here together. We're here for God. We're going to stick together. Somehow this is going to happen. And we'll just not give up. You know, God gets tired if you don't give up. I mean, working on miracles and answered prayers, I, I looked up a lot of what Master says about prayer. You know, he, it's very interesting. And these are very important phrases. God listens and answers almost all of your prayers. And it, it, just, it just says, Master says that in several places. That was a terrible misappropriation of his quote. But he just says, God is answering your prayers all the time. God answers your sincere prayers. Heavens, what could be more sincere than the desire of all of you dedicated devotees to want to manifest this for the glory of God and for the benefit of others? So there just has to be this um, unshakable commitment to that. And just don't let the, don't sweat the small stuff. Like that you don't have any place to live or any money to do it. <laughs> Minor details. Minor details. And, and I'm not being fatuous in that because, believe me, you don't get money unless you put out energy. So this is not that kind of empty affirmation where we'll all just sit here and it'll fall in our lap. No, you'll work really hard and you'll be tested. You'll be really tested. Don't worry about it. I mean, don't worry that, it'll, that you won't get the chance to and don't worry about it. Because it's not really Tess. At Swami Jesus, you know, so that's how Swami puts it. Tess? What Tess? Oh yeah, I've had to put out energy. But putting out energy is not a test unless you think of it as a test. It's just putting out energy. It's just picking up those little leather bound suitcases in those 1935 clothes. And <laughs> just walking down the road here. But just don't, don't doubt. And whatever he takes you through, just go through it with the, with the thought right there. This will happen. You know, somebody may have to dig the hole before the building is built, but if that's us, no problem. Somebody has to do it. You know, and then it will. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yes. Hello, nice to see you again. Uh-huh. Nice to see you again. Um, when I was in my teens, early teens, I lost something and I prayed for six months. Uh-huh. I don't think I thought about it that I'm, I'm going to, but I did it. And I did get it. Uh-huh. And then I lost it again. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And I was very happy that I did because I saw that what I wanted was not what I can. Yeah, it's very and interesting. Since then, I've been very scared of asking for something specific. That's why you, you have to ask for the energy and the consciousness and then let God determine the form. Now, in the case of a community, I mean, th this is a difference here. I mean, in the case of your case, you may be appropriately concerned about your egoic misunderstanding of where happiness comes from. Okay. So in that case, you have to say, Lord, you know, teach me to love you. Teach me where true happiness comes from. Give me what I need in order to be a better person. You know, figure out what you can say sincerely. And that, but it's very important that it be sincere. And if it's really this big, that's better than a prayer that's this big that you, you can't really pray with your whole heart. That's why when Laurie said that about, you know, teach me that human love is a distraction. Oh, you don't believe that. You know, you have to say sincerely. But Lord, what I really want is joy. What I really want is happiness. What I really want is courage. And this is how I think I'm going to get it. But if you disagree, focus on the essence of it. In the case of the community, Swamiji was giving us a different lesson for a different reason. Don't worry about this being right or wrong. Of course it's a good idea. So it's just different 
the, the danger of egoic misunderstanding is itself the danger in the case of the community. In the case of my own little world and all my things that I want, egoic misunderstanding is a serious issue. So you have to just be very sincere with God. Yeah. And if you did specifically pray for one thing and got it and lost it and so on, whoa, that's something to learn from, isn't it? Yeah, what do I know? You know, I know that I want happiness and I want not to suffer. So Lord, you, should, you take, take me down that road, whatever that is. Dharma Devi, when you raise your hand, I realize it's not personal. You're raising your hand for, the, for that. Yeah, um Daya was asking... Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell the story. They're starting a community uh-huh. and where they have uh, a lot of big families. Uh-huh. Can you talk about maybe something? You mean like multi-gen... She's talking about India. What does she want me to talk about? She's just not giving me a better clue than that? No, it was, that was kind of it. Well, you know... I'll, I'm going to answer it in a way that's completely not going to be helpful to her, but... <laughs> She'll ask you again when yeah. you're there. I'm going to see her in a week so she can ask for that. But it was very interesting to watch Swamiji go to another country. Like he, when he went to Italy, for example, when he, when Ananda went to Italy to start a work in Italy, you know, he's, Swamiji is in the moment and he tunes into the vibrations at hand. And actually, I think this might be an intelligent answer after all, maybe even helpful. Um, it's exactly the same thing we've been talking about. You ask yourself, what is the spirit here? What spirit are we trying to create? And then try to feel how that spirit would manifest in this new circumstance. And in a different culture, I mean, I have a lot of Indian friends, not only in India, but a lot of people in Silicon Valley are from India. And the way, this is so funny, they'll say things, uh, excuse me, this is not really funny to them, but they'll say to me, well, you know, I would really do that, but my mother would not approve. Or, or you know, I've, I've thought of doing that, but when I asked my mother, she didn't want me to do that. And I'm an American, and I say, so? <laughs> you know, like, so? Like your mother didn't approve? Like, and? <laughs> and then I've come to really appreciate, you know, it's just a whole different world. It's not necessarily because Swami, there's a, a story in here, and it was actually an Indian man who asked him. Swamiji asked this Indian man to take on a certain responsibility. The Indian man replied, Oh, my mother would be very disappointed. And Swamiji said, You have to be prepared to disappoint your mother. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's part of it. But the other part of it is you have to build your building with what's in front of you. And if you're building in a country where you have this intact family structure, multi-generational, you have to use that as a building block because you can't ask people to begin by shifting something that has never crossed their mind they even ought to shift. And when I think of how Swami, when I think of us and how Swami built Ananda, out of us and what we must have looked like to him at that time. Just, but he did it because he, he always had that picture in his mind of where we were going and he didn't sweat the small stuff. He just looked at the sincerity we had and he kept, you know, just humming the ohm, basically. And slowly by slowly, we, we heard the note and we found it. And all the, like this, in the end, just didn't make any difference. So you just have to keep just pulling on that. And that's that that you're holding, which is where I started. Fellowship of self-realization. We're here for personal growth. We're not here to be safe. It doesn't really matter what happens to us. We just have to keep opening our hearts, keep loving each other, loving God in one another. And in the end, you're, suddenly you're there. I, 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 I I love being the age that I am. You know, people worry about age, except that I can't open jars. It's really hard. But I love it because I can look back and I realize, you know, what was such a big crisis? What was the big hoofla about? It was such a big kerfuffle at the time. And so when the next one comes across, I can say, eh, you know, I've lived through worse. 
and you just keep going like that. It's a, it's a satisfaction beyond expression. And we all have some of it, because we wouldn't be here because of reincarnation. We have some of it. And if you're just dealing with lots of families, then your community looks different. And, but it'll have vibrational integrity gradually. That's what's so much fun. And on just the same the world over. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Yeah. All right. Well, this is my appointed ending time, to which I am very loyal. I don't have any place to go, so I'm very happy to talk to any of you all for as long as you might like. But this is the formal ending of the evening. Do we have to end it with anything more formal than that? All right. You could do a prayer for yeah. just visualizing. Okay. Let's imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Swami Kriyananda has often said, well, Master said, Los Angeles is the Bar- Benares of the West. I'm sure you all say that to each other really often. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think Palo Alto is the Bar- Benares of the West. <laughs> but there's a unique spiritual vibration to this place. Master came here of every place on the planet he could have come to. Swamiji still says, in many ways, Los Angeles is my home. After all, he was with Master. How could it be otherwise? Is he has, Swamiji has tried over and over again to, to plant the roots of Ananda in this city. And it's, it's been a bit of a rocky soil. Um, and not because of the hearts of the people here, because the people are wonderful. But there's, you know, there's a karmic obstacle. And... Uh, You've got the plows in your hands right now, and it doesn't matter how many stones are in the field. You know, somebody's going to have to just do that work. So just put your hand to the plow, in a sense. I mean, the visualization you want is, Master, use us. You know, we can, we can see it. We have it in the four walls here. We have it in our satsangs. We have it in our music. We know where we're going. We're willing to walk whatever route you want us to walk, we see it over there. Just guide our footsteps. I will reason, I will will, I will act, but guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right path in everything. So let's hold that thought just really powerfully. Lord, I'm not going to quit. That's just all you have to say. I'm not going to quit. We're here. We're going to do it. Sooner or later, we're going to do it. Heavenly Father, Father, Divine Mother, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Christ, Babaji Krishna, Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Yukteswar, Beloved Master, Master, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, humbly we bow to you all. We are your instruments. Give meaning to our lives by letting us be an expression of your will and consciousness. Help us to serve your work by serving others, by creating visible expressions of your divine presence in buildings, in places to live, in places to worship, in ways to serve. We are your children. Awaken us, us. guide us, us. bless us with success. success. Om. Let's rub our hands together and let's send out an Om vibration to the universe, asking that we be allowed to manifest God's will. Om.
That was great fun. Thank you all very much. <laughs>